Since the dawn of the internet, there has always been a strong demand for video content, and in the early days, this content was scarce. It was possible to upload, watch, and share videos in the early days of the internet, but it wasn't easy, in fact, it was actually rather difficult. First, you have to realize that the internet has been commercially available since the 80s, and if you know anything about 80s and 90s internet, you know that at this time, snail's pace dial-up was the norm. This was the primary entry hazard as far as the hindrance of video sharing in the early internet. It simply took way too much time to upload and download video files. I'm talking 20 minutes to load a two minute video in some cases. Another entry hazard being digital format cameras suitable for uploading videos were not as common as they are today. It sounds crazy, right? But really, in the 80s and 90s and even early 2000s, your average person was not filming videos with digital cameras unless they were an amateur filmmaker or a college student. It just wasn't common practice to video record everything as it is today. Now in the smartphone era, I mean, we record almost everything. And the final reason why videos were difficult to be shared in the early internet, there simply was not a well-designed video hosting platform like YouTube. Now don't misunderstand me here. There were video hosting websites that existed, just not as user-friendly as YouTube is. Once broadband internet became popular in the early to mid 2000s, so did the rise of more powerful camera equipped cell phones. This meant now pretty much anyone with a cell phone had the ability to make a video and could save it to a SIM card, then upload the video onto the internet shortly after using their lightning fast broadband internet. So this sounds great, right? But it gets even better because a few keen entrepreneurs who were former PayPal employees saw this perfect storm brewing and in the year 2005, they create YouTube. Now all these people with cell phones and broadband internet have a user-friendly website to upload their family vacation and pet videos. Nobody would have expected the massive success that YouTube has enjoyed. From humble beginnings, shaky, grainy cell phone recorded videos with no editing whatsoever, to studio quality productions with paid staff, directors, and writers. People literally making millions of dollars uploading videos to the site. The slogan, broadcast yourself, inspiring the average person that they too could become the stars they'd always dreamed of being. And as long as they had the talent, a camera, and the drive to make something truly special, they could do it. YouTube created an alternative route to the stardom, and more importantly, an alternative to television. We've seen many different eras of content creators, trends, styles, and drama throughout the years here on YouTube. And in this video, we're going to be taking a walk through over 10 years of YouTube community history and define time periods by attributes associated with them. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the evolutionary history of YouTube. Years 2005 through 2008 the viral era. This is the beginning, the proverbial Big Bang of YouTube. Welcome to the viral era. The viral era gets its name from the short viral videos which dominated in YouTube's early years. But before we get to defining what a viral video is, let's try to get an understanding of what YouTube videos generally look like in this infant stage of YouTube. This is the first video ever uploaded to YouTube, Me at the Zoo, uploaded by the user Jod or Jawed. Note the graininess of the footage, terrible audio, and just complete absence of editing. This is the norm within the viral era. You may think that this video is unwatchable, but the first comment left on a YouTube video ever disagrees. Cobalt Groove finds this video interesting. Now this video was actually uploaded by YouTube co-founder Jawed Kareem, perhaps uploaded as a test or a kickoff for the newly launched platform. There would be millions of videos like me at the zoo that would appear within the viral era. 
mundane, dull, uninspired videos, often from a family vacation or just videos of pets playing with each other, or just undiscernible blurs. A lot of undiscernible blurs. Early YouTube was essentially a dumping ground for whatever footage you had lying around on an old SD card inside of your camera, or some footage you'd snapped with your flip camera phone while out with some friends. There was little to no refinement, no precedent set for what a good YouTube video should look like, and naturally, most of the content was garbage and rendered mostly unwatchable for a normal human being. However, despite the overwhelming amount of low-quality video content that was uploaded to the website at this time, there would be some videos that were so bizarre, so avant-garde, so, so watchable, that they would hit the viral lottery. A viral video is defined as any clip of animation or film that is spread rapidly through online sharing. And these videos fought their way clawing tooth through the seemingly unending sea of low quality videos which mired themselves on YouTube at that time. And they rose to the top, like cream rising to the top of fresh milk. These videos surfaced from the chamber pot of shit and piss that was YouTube videos in this 2005 through 2008 time period and they emerged from this chamber pot basked in all the glory that they so rightfully earned. These videos would spread like wildfire, finding themselves shared on internet message boards and early social media websites, emails, and wherever else people could share them. This is where you get the whole viral video concept from. Get it? They spread like a virus. This was an exciting time to be a YouTube user, an internet user. Hell, it was an exciting time to be alive. This was a time where we weren't as connected as we are today. Information was shared at a much slower pace. And because we were not so connected, viral videos had much longer half-lives than videos of today. Compared to the modern YouTube landscape where a video goes viral and loses its hold as a cultural zeitgeist within days, Viral era videos would stay trending for months, even years at a time. This was a really magical moment for YouTube. I remember being in middle school and a friend of mine told me, Dude, have you seen that dramatic chipmunk video? It's so damn funny. I would go home, search it up, and proceed to watch it over and over again. And after you get that first hit of your initial viral video experience, you just want to find more. So you kept browsing YouTube on a constant search for more entertainment. And all of a sudden, YouTube became somewhere where you could be consistently entertained. You could sit there for hours watching viral videos. I believe it's fair to say that if a video goes viral, it must be entertaining to some degree, right? This is the most important point to take away from the viral era. The viral era is the story of how a website was born, a metaphorical helpless infant. And over time, the infant learns to crawl, and then stand, and then walk. And finally, it learns to run, and it never stops. YouTube could have easily failed within the first few years following its inception, but videos found their way onto the website that would captivate millions and gave a stronger meaning to the YouTube slogan, Broadcast Yourself. Make a video and put it out there because it just might go viral. As we close out the viral era of YouTube, we begin to notice a change within the landscape of the platform. The chaotic spontaneity of the viral era doesn't go away, but it's no longer the highlight of YouTube as a whole. The following era begins a transition into formulaic video production, jump cuts, scheduled video uploads, and the emergence of what we now know today as the YouTuber. The YouTuber. 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 There has been one thing about early YouTube that I've been glossing over, purposefully. The first implementation of YouTube's paid partner program back in 2007. In the early days, this paid partner program really was not that relevant. You had to actually have a decent amount of subscribers to even qualify for it. And YouTube didn't roll ads on videos at this time, so honestly, it didn't change the experience too much for the viewer. It was just a means for creators to make some cash. However, as time goes on, we begin to see the positive and negative impacts on the website as a whole. 
years 2009 through 2011, the golden era. 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 The golden era. One of the greatest parts about YouTube as a platform is that it provides the average person with the ability to make a video and express themselves to a broad audience free of charge. From playing music to telling humorous stories or giving insightful commentaries or perhaps showcasing amazing physical feats, YouTube is a place for the average person to show the world what you are all about. And around 2009, I believe this was the time when people realized that it was possible to establish a brand built from these talents here on YouTube. And with that realization, you begin to see the first wave of YouTube content creators. A wave of creators that would upload regularly, create communities around their channels, and really develop a cult of personality surrounding themselves. The golden era's defining trait is the birth of what we now know today as the YouTuber. The YouTuber within the golden era is a completely different beast, however, when compared to the YouTubers of today. Keep in mind that the site itself was still in its fledgling stages and people really didn't know what they were doing. One major innovation was the discovery of a highly useful video editing technique known as the jump cut. Early YouTubers found that by splicing out boring parts of a video during post-editing, you could create a rapid-fire, tightly edited video that was much easier to watch for the viewer. Jump cuts would forever become the norm here on YouTube and are still in usage to this day, perhaps to excess in some cases, but still a revolutionary discovery. Despite this remarkable innovation, in a big picture scope, YouTubers were simply not as efficient as they are today with their daily upload schedules and 10 minute videos. Video production quality was not nearly as high either as HD cameras were still a new concept and fewer people had experience with video editing. The normal upload schedule was a new video every week and in some cases every two weeks. And this sounds completely absurd in today's YouTube landscape, but in this time, it was expected, and actually rather enjoyed by many. Each video your favorite YouTuber would release had an added weight attached to it. Each video was something that you would catch yourself really looking forward to, much like waiting a week to watch a new Game of Thrones episode. Slow and steady is how the YouTubers did it in the golden era. In 2009, we got our first taste of those skippable 5 second pre-roll ads, which was met with universal disdain. It was a growing pain to be fair, but this was one of the first signs of the overall corporatization and monetization of YouTube as a platform. More on that later. Now that we've given a snapshot of the YouTube landscape within the golden era, it's important that we take a look at some of the big names from the time. There are a handful of these first wave YouTubers that are actually still making videos on the site today and actually thriving but many of them have fallen off to the wayside, perhaps due to inactivity or just unable to continue production of quality content. One of the first big YouTubers that comes to mind when I think of OG YouTube is Ray William Johnson and his Equals 3 show. Johnson started Equals 3 back in 2009 and it was a massive success for its time. He pioneered some of the YouTube video making techniques that are still in use to this day. Johnson created his own YouTube show, essentially filming from the same location each episode, styling his background, and really turning his YouTube channel into more of a brand. Ray has since fallen into irrelevancy due to him leaving the show and hiring a different host in his place, and that didn't go over well with his fans. Another example of a YouTuber using this show building technique is the infamous YouTuber known as Fred. Fred created a character which he would play within his vlog style videos and his channel really blew up around 2009 and the idea of playing a character for YouTube was essentially popularized. Another YouTuber who would take this whole character gag and run with it is Boogie2988 who made some of his classic Francis videos within the time of the golden era. Creating characters for YouTube is a practice that we would see up until this day. I mean think of people like Filthy Frank. In addition to branding, show development, and character implementation, you begin to see the emergence of the first vloggers. Vlogging in the golden era carried a different meaning than what it does now. 
vlogging or video blogging as it was originally called, featured average people telling stories or holding discussions about trending topics. Several YouTubers come to mind like Jenna Marbles, Fluffy Talks, Sneega Higa, Shane Dawson, Boxy, and many more. And you also had the seeds for some of the future stars being sown at this time. The golden era is really what I think about as classic YouTube. This is the YouTube that I spent a lot of my high school years browsing. I often revisit old animations found on YouTube from this time and it just brings me back to a better place. While this version of YouTube is gone, we can still get a glimpse back into our adolescence with these videos. And for that, I am grateful. Years 2012 through 2015, the RPG era. Welcome to the RPG era. I know a lot of you are scratching your heads like, was there a YouTube role-playing game that I wasn't aware of? Well, in this case, RPG stands for React, Prank, and Gaming Era which were the genre of videos that dominated during this time. It was essentially a trifecta of genres that completely took over the platform, and we'll talk about each of them individually. Let's begin with gaming, and specifically, Let's Plays. So what is a Let's Play? Let's Plays are essentially videos of a YouTuber playing a video game with their commentary and reaction to the said game. A rather simple concept, but YouTubers at the time took the idea and ran with it. It's impossible to mention Let's Plays without thinking of one particular YouTuber. Care to take a guess? Yeah, PewDiePie. PewDiePie is widely considered to be the godfather of the Let's Play genre, starting back in 2010 with Let's Plays of mostly horror games such as Amnesia. He gained massive popularity on the website, and by the time 2013 rolled around, he had amassed a whopping 10 million subscribers, a growth never before seen. With PewDiePie getting the ball rolling, gaming quickly became one of the most popular genres of video on YouTube. And many other YouTubers found massive success on the platform such as Markiplier and Jacksepticeye using this Let's Play formula. At the same time, we started to see a massive growth in the YouTube user base and the website seemed to explode into the mainstream. Take for example PewDiePie being featured in an episode of South Park, I mean how more mainstream can you get? The following chart is a snapshot of the amount of video hours that were uploaded across YouTube's history and notice a spike around 2012 and 2013. People were generally becoming more aware of YouTube and the incentive to upload and watch was greater than ever. Another interesting phenomenon that was occurring outside of YouTube at this time was a boom in indie gaming. This provided streamers excellent fodder for Let's Plays, games like Goat Simulator and Five Nights at Freddy's come to mind immediately. YouTubers and YouTube viewers alike became obsessed with these bizarre indie titles and YouTube was the place to go if you wanted to check them out before purchasing. Twitch had been experiencing a massive boom during this time as well and YouTube was the perfect place for you to dump clips from your Twitch streams, edit them up and make a highlight video. Now that the gaming scene in the RPG era has been covered, let's move on to prank videos. Prank videos have always been a staple on YouTube. Old school pranksters such as Ed Bassmaster come to mind immediately. Bassmaster is truly a pranking legend who had been in the game for years coming up with elaborate pranks and would often play a character within his videos for comedic effects. However, in the RPG era, you begin to see a new wave of pranksters, and these pranks border the line of being entertaining and downright despicable. The RPG era of pranks often involve some innocent bystander, and often to the bystander's dismay. Pranks of this era involve cruel jokes, and really the philosophy is do whatever you can to get views and attention, and therefore money. Members of the RPG pranking community include Sam Pepper, Moe and Ethan Bradbury, FoozyTube, Roman Atwood, and many more. 
Not only would these pranks often portray violent and sociopathic behaviors as socially acceptable, oftentimes these pranks would be faked, thus painting a false reality of the world that we live in, making the greater public seem more aggressive and hostile. This was going unchecked for quite some time until finally the whole YouTube community decided that these pranks must be stopped. And this movement could arguably be traced to H3H3 Productions' crusade against YouTube pranksters, which he initiated in the tail end of the RPG era and the years following. Now, despite the questionable behavior these RPG pranksters were participating in, they do deserve some credit for opening up YouTube to a wider audience. Pranks are a universally understandable form of entertainment, and with so much of this content being uploaded to the site at that time, this provided a lot more incentive for people outside of YouTube to finally get on the site and subscribe to some channels. And this opens the rabbit hole for these new YouTubers to dig deeper and find other forms of entertainment here on YouTube. Prank videos were easily shared on Facebook and Twitter, and were accessible for wider audiences. So despite the moral falls of these prank channels, they did help in growing the site. I guess these guys were just growing pains within the development of YouTube. It was a stage that we had to experience. One of the most popular and controversial genres of video that exists on YouTube even to this day is the reaction video genre. Most people immediately think of the Jinx style reaction videos when this genre is talked about and for the most part this is what you would have expected especially at this time. Reactions are extremely accessible and easy to digest for outside audiences. These Jinx style reaction videos were very easy to produce and YouTube's algorithm supported them heavily at this time. If you searched a music video by your favorite artist, at the top of the suggested videos in the sidebar, you could bet money that a reaction for that said video would be at the top of the suggested list. And there have been so many reactors that it would be impossible to list them all, but notable ones include Fine Bros, Tyrone Magnus, Jinx, and at the end of this era, you get H3H3. One thing to note about reaction channels is that there's a wide gap in creativity when it comes to these videos and they can be done badly and they can be done well. I suppose it's all up to one's personal taste, but really these videos were everywhere and similar to prank videos are loathed to some degree. One parallel that reaction videos and prank videos share is accessibility and the ability to be consumed by a wide audience. These videos did bring people onto YouTube. Now that I've covered the trifecta of reactions, pranks, and gaming videos that make up the RPG era, I want to add a bit of a footnote here. This is where I give a nod to what I like to call the counterculture community here on YouTube, which I think the major contributors of this community join the site at this time. These are the creators who push the boundaries of creativity and challenge social norms. They make content which would feel right at home on Adult Swim. I'm talking about the Filthy Franks, the Anthony Fantanos, the H3H3s, the iDubs, and many more. It's really hard for me to give these guys a genre, but their start was within this era, and I feel like it's important to acknowledge them as a nod to those who personally inspire me to make videos here on YouTube. They remind me of the core philosophy of what YouTube should be about, being weird, bizarre, challenging being you. As we wrap up the RPG era, we head into an era full of controversy and turmoil. Brace yourself, it's about to get complicated. Years 2016 to the present day, the dramatic era. As the YouTube community grew, it was inevitable at some point that we would experience some internal quarrels here on the site. Controversy and drama is what has marked the most recent era here on YouTube and there really is much to talk about. You begin to see YouTubers making videos about other YouTubers, the infamous exposed videos. The commentary community experienced a massive boom during this time and you begin to see names like Leafy is here pop up. On the flip side of the commentary community, people like H3H3 begin exposing pranksters and social experimenters like the Bradbury Bros and Joey Salads. The YouTube community as a whole became obsessed with calling out one another. In some cases it was deserved and in some cases it wasn't. Many are instantly reminded of the whole drama surrounding Mr. Drama Alert himself, Keenstar where the whole entire commentary community went on a vicious witch hunt to tear him down, which ultimately backfired on those exposing him with the exception of iDubs. 
Keemstar exposes arguably the biggest drama moment in the history of the entire platform and helps shape the hostile environment on the website. An environment where YouTubers are willing to backstab and betray personal friends if it means that they can make exposed videos and get millions of views from it. From leaked DM messages to doxing YouTubers' addresses, anything was fair game for clicks. The YouTube community was also more vigilant and self-regulating than ever. The community began to actively oust people from YouTube who were making content that was deemed morally wrong or detestable. H3H3 and iDubs are two very prominent watchdog YouTubers that come to mind who are responsible for having big impacts on several YouTubers from the community who were deemed dangerous or cancerous. We had our first major lawsuit on the website, in this case a YouTuber known as Matt Haas Zone had sued H3H3 Productions for a satirical reaction video that they'd made. H3H3 would end up winning the lawsuit and it finally set a precedent for YouTube copyright procedure. Philip DeFranco helped blow the lid off a child abuse case which was happening over on the YouTube channel Daddy of Five, a family-themed channel where the parents would film themselves abusing and manipulating their children simply for the means of making ad revenue. It was disgusting and because of the YouTube community, these crooks have been to court and are now facing jail time. Now while this drama is happening, you simultaneously saw some major structural changes within YouTube itself. YouTube announces its YouTube Heroes program which essentially incentivizes YouTube users to flag content which some people may find inappropriate or hate speech. This is where we begin to see YouTube beginning a turn to a more PC route. YouTube's administration began cracking down on edgy content and YouTubers begin to fear that their careers may be in jeopardy as more and more videos begin to be flagged due to inappropriate content. These creators feared that they'd be the next on the YouTube hero hit list. Then in February 2017, everyone's fears were confirmed. A double-sided controversy emerged on YouTube. Two events that took place at the same time and they would change the platform as we know it forever. PewDiePie gets a hit piece written about him by Wall Street Journal calling him an anti-Semite because of some jokes that he made on his channel. And then, major advertisers began pulling ads from YouTube because a separate incident occurred. A video appeared on Twitter of a Coca-Cola ad playing on a racist video. Thus begins the adpocalypse. I must state first and foremost that I don't blame PewDiePie at all for the adpocalypse. It was just an unfortunate situation and the mainstream media decided to target PewDiePie because he is the biggest non-music YouTuber on the platform. Because of the adpocalypse, YouTube will automatically flag videos with curse words in them or videos that contain political discussion or as alternative comedy that may be deemed unacceptable by PC members of the audience. And this decision was made by YouTube in order to keep the big advertisers like Coca-Cola around on the website. Now, YouTubers who have been on the site for years are starting to find their entire channels being demonetized in front of their eyes. With the threat of losing their careers, people must change their content to be more family friendly if they want to make it here on the site and not be censored. Which in my opinion stifles creativity and ruins what really makes YouTube great. Must I say it again, being you. Not being a censored or toned down version of you, but you in the purest form. It pains me to see some of the greatest creators on this website who have stuck around for so long being put down and stripped of their financial reward and then we have newer YouTubers from other platforms like Vine such as Jake and Logan Paul being rewarded for low quality content just because it's marketable and kid friendly. To round out the end of this era and the end of this video, I would like to propose a solution for the adpocalypse. And at this moment, I would like to give credit to a smaller YouTube channel known as Wang for the inspiration of this idea. Essentially how YouTube works is advertisers may be big or small, massive companies all the way to the average Joe buying an advertisement for their small business or just to promote a band or something. When you play a YouTube video, all available advertisements go through a bidding process and the advertiser which is willing to offer more for that ad spot gets played on the video you clicked on. This is why you see big name brand advertisements on these family friendly videos because the advertisers are willing to offer the most and they're confident that the video on which the ad is played on will in no way hurt their brand because YouTube has flagged said video is suitable for all advertisers. So what about the advertisers who pay less? Or the ads that lose the bid? Allow these low paying ads to appear on videos flagged as not suitable for monetization. Give advertisers the option to select if they want their ads playing on edgy videos. 
indie gaming companies, small business owners, bands, and even other YouTubers. This would open the lane for smaller advertisers to promote their products to a targeted audience, which they've decided to be more relevant to their product. And in some cases, you'd find more success than when advertising on a family-friendly video. While simultaneously giving smaller YouTubers the opportunity to make the content they want and still gain monetization. I gotta say outright, I'm by no means an insider, and I have little to no experience in marketing, but on paper this sounds like a fairly decent plan. So help me get this idea to YouTube staff. Spread the hashtag, hashtag add it up. Let YouTube know we support obscure content here on the platform and we can reach a compromise that is beneficial for YouTube, YouTubers, and advertisers alike. So I guess it's time for a final dissertation. YouTube has touched so many people throughout its lifespan here on the internet and it's birthed stars, given people careers, and toppled television. It changed the way we consume media. We laughed, we cried, we were outraged, and we were united. From the wrong side of YouTube all the way to the trending tab, from the Let's Plays to the Cat videos, everything that's here exists for one reason, to entertain. As a 14-year-old kid back in 2007, I made my first YouTube video. It wasn't very good looking back. But I'm proud of myself for at least trying, and I encourage you all to do the same. Make your first video. And with enough passion, dedication, and hard work, your dream can become a reality. This is the evolutionary history of YouTube. Thanks for watching. take a moment to give a shout out to some smaller channels which I think are making amazing content and you should definitely check out and subscribe to. Please check out Willie Mac Show and Wang. Both of these guys are friends of the channel and similar to mine are students of YouTube. And these guys have some great discussion videos so really if you have some time please go check them out. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at TheWavyWebSurf and if you want to get comment of the day in the next video make sure you leave a comment below. Hey, and join the Discord, we're having some great conversations in there. And if you want to be super homie, donate to me on Patreon. Peace.